So welcome back, everyone. This is the Quant University guest lecture series. And I'm Sri Krishnamurthy, and we've been hosting these sessions for the last two years. We've had more than 50 guest speakers uh, coming from various perspectives, primarily focused on artificial intelligence, machine learning, and applications of these technologies in the real world, in academia, and various research settings. We have been looking at various themes on how artificial intelligence and machine learning could be adopted in various situations, especially when there is uh, aspects of bias involved, explainability involved, security involved. And we've been looking at various themes on how these various issues could be addressed. And today we are fortunate to have Reva Schwartz from NIST, which is the National Institute of Standards and Technology. And recently NIST uh, issued a white paper on uh, towards a standard for identifying and managing bias in artificial intelligence. And Riva is the lead author of it. And uh, through one of my connections, Patrick Hall from BNH, who I frequently collaborate with, I got introduced to Riva, and uh, Riva graciously accepted our invitation to come and speak about this white paper at this uh, guest lecture series. So we are very excited to have you, Riva. And um, welcome to the Quantum University guest, uh, guest lecture series. <clears throat> Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, and uh, Riva has uh, done a lot of work in forensics, and uh, I'll let Riva introduce herself, but uh, I was very fascinated with all the work she's been doing in the area of bias, and also with the new AI risk management framework, which uh, which NIST is putting together, and the recent draft has been released uh, a few weeks ago now. And I think that comments are due on April 29th. So I would, if you're uh, involved with AI risk management, I would highly uh, advocate you to take a look at the framework and please provide your feedback. And also uh, as a couple of announcements, uh, we are having another session next Tuesday, primarily focused on model risk management for machine learning models. Uh, we are having the AI risk management certificate program through Quant University, and we are gonna have a live session in June, so if, if you're, I'm sorry, in May, so if you're interested in joining our session there, please attend our uh, webinar, which is gonna happen next Tuesday. And also the second week of May, we are gonna be hosting an information session for the newly formed program on data science and uh, uh, Python for investment professionals, which we are doing in partnership with the CFA Institute. So we're gonna be sending out invites for an information session. It's available on the CFA Institute's website. If you're interested, you can go and check it out. And that's another uh, session you'd be interested in, especially if you're an investment professional and you are interested in applications of Python in the area of data science. So with those announcements, I will hand over the stage to you, Riva. The stage is yours. Welcome thank again. You. Thank you, Shri. Um, and thank you for the, the plug. I was, I was gonna do that myself. So it's nice that, yes, please, <laughs> Make sure um, we released the risk management framework uh, version one uh, back in mid-March, just after actually the release of this document, uh, the deck of which I'm, I'm going to talk about. Um, and so comments are due back uh, this coming Friday. So please, please do uh, try and uh, for all of you try and uh, take a look and provide your comments. Um, so my name is Rita Schwartz. I'm a research scientist at NIST, uh, where I'm part of the uh, team working on, uh, well, I'm part of the trustworthy and responsible AI team working on the risk uh, AI risk management framework, and I also lead the work on uh, bias and in artificial intelligence. Um, NIST is an agency under the Department of Commerce, whose mission is to promote American innovation and industrial competitiveness. Uh, as I said, I, I or maybe I didn't state that I work in the Inf information technology laboratory. Uh, that is one of the six laboratories at NIST. And the one of the uh, goals of the AI program at NIST within the ITL is to conduct foundational research to advance trustworthy AI technologies. Um, uh, as uh, Shri had alluded to, our, our program centers around this risk management framework for AI. And as part of the risk management framework, NIST has identified specific characteristics that trustworthy systems need to demonstrate. Um, managing bias is one of those characteristics, and today I'm going to focus exclusively on that. Um, I recognize, of course, that I, uh, most of you are all probably uh, experts on risk management, specifically in your industry of finance. 
Um, but uh, risk management, you know, so it's a core value for, for probably all of you. And uh, probably much of what I'm gonna to present today will be familiar to you, but I do hope that there are still a few, few new things. Um, before I start, I wanna, um, as I said, this uh, presentation stems from the special publication that Shri had mentioned was released in, in March. Um, I am the lead author. I want to take uh, the opportunity to uh, thank and recognize my co-authors, Apostol Vasilev, Christine, Christine Green, Lori Perrine, all of, we are all part of uh, ITL, and then Andrew Burr and Patrick Hall, uh, who are NIST grantees, um, and their company is called BNH. And I, I understand that Patrick had given a pre previous uh, presentation. So moving on. Um, uh, so before I start, I want to lay out uh, three big themes from the talk today, which will, I think, help scope the conversation. Um, so first of all, why, while AI is likely to be a net positive for society, it does come with significant risks. Uh, these are risks that can be to individuals, groups, organizations, uh, like companies, or also to society. The, these risks can be adversarial in nature, um, or they can stem from the actual AI itself as it was designed and developed. Um, so the focus of our discussion today will be about the risk of AI bias, specifically bias, and specifically the use of AI-based decision systems. Um, but I think it's important to note that uh, normalizing the idea that AI has risks is necessary because uh, I think it's uh, kind of mis misunderstood that a lot of people tend to think that AI is kind of uh, perfect or, or will uh, fix a lot of problems and not bring a, a lot of problems along with it. Um, the second big theme is that traditional approaches for mitigating bias tend to focus almost exclusively on computational aspects of bias, um, but a more comprehensive approach commonly referred to as socio-technical is necessary. And the bulk of this conversation and the paper that, that we um, published is uh, focused on socio-technical approaches. Um, and then the third overarching theme is that governance and related structural and cultural practices are essential for transforming the way we think about and approach AI risks. I'm sure that comes as no surprise um, to these, uh, to you, the participants in this. Um, so, so this slide, what is the big message here? So what is bias um, and is it always negative? So no, um, bias isn't always negative. In fact, um, well, uh, if we're talking about human bias, those biases exist actually sometimes to protect us, but, um, but there's also institutional biases or, or other biases that are not, they're just a thing. They're not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, it's a good and bad side. And then also um, uh, companies can kind of learn about your, um, biases and present you and serve you information based on those biases that are not always negative, that are in fact um, positive. But um, so why, you know, why is this a problem? Why, why, why do we care, I guess? Um, so first of all, again, uh, in, in the risk management framework, uh, mitigating AI bias is identified as a socio-technical uh, characteristic uh, to, to reach trustworthiness. Um, but and one of the reasons why is because bias can have extensive uh, discriminatory results or other harmful impacts in, across a variety of, um, of contexts, including employment, education, housing. And this discrimination can occur by race, age, ability, gender, among many other um, categories. The, the real uh, reason I think why um, why AI is different than other software and the risks from other, other things is that the scale and the speed of AI-based decisions and then therefore the bias in those decisions can go far beyond traditional discriminatory practices. So if you have a hiring um, a team who, you know, just is uh, reviewing, reviewing, you know, old school review of, of resumes, the damage, like it, let's say people are just, they're always gonna hire the people from the same universities that they went to, um, not intending to be discriminatory. It's just, uh, they haven't gotten with the idea of implicit bias and, and you know, for whatever reason, you know, maybe they live in a bubble. Um, so they're, they're always hiring the same people. Well, the damage that can be done by one um, HR team is, is pretty limited and they're probably gonna get sued and, and <laughs> need to come into compliance. Um, but uh, you know, an AI-based decision system across uh, thousands, hundreds of thousands of companies around the world, uh, that 
those kinds of discriminatory um, results can have a huge impact. Um, so by not addressing the risk of, of bias that, you know, uh, in those kinds of uh, decisions, um, leave the organizations in the enterprise uh, open to uh, the risk of non-compliance. Um, and then uh, kind of alluded to it in, in the previous, or, or when I was mentioning the three big themes, but um, bias can also um, splash out into society and then contribute to an erosion of public trust. So um, if a big uh, percentage of Americans feel that you know uh, these these technologies are not trustworthy, then we really uh, have a problem. So um, we've we've already mentioned that the risks are real, but uh, but you know the growth and prevalence of algorithmic decision systems and these are AI based decision based systems, I'm sure that you're familiar with how they are used, for example, in fintech, can drive a decreased sense of trust in AI. Um, and this really comes from the sense that um, uh, there are historical and social biases at, at a minimum baked into the data um, and the assumptions used in the algorithmic models that create these, that where the decisions come from. Um, and these algorithmic models then have a higher probability of producing and amplifying unjust outcomes. So again, organizations that deploy such models and systems without managing these risks can not only harm their users, but jeopardize their reputation. So this um, kind of uh, 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 iceberg graphic comes from the uh, document. And what we're trying to convey with this is that um, uh, the, the current and, and traditional focus on AI-based bias or biases that occur in AI tend to focus almost exclusively on statistical and computational biases. So within the data or within the model, um, uh, how, and, and we'll get to the next slide, we'll, we'll go through some, or I actually, it's in two slides, uh, some of those examples of statistical bias. But in fact, of course, there's a whole lot of other uh, biases. And in SP 1270, we categorized three major categories of bias in AI. There may be more. Um, we are focusing on three. Um, and starting with the bottom of the of the iceberg, um, there are systemic biases, uh, go into detail about what those are, and then there's human biases. Um, so while AI technologies can perform perfectly accurately from a statistical and computational sense, um, they can still contribute to harmful outcomes because we're not paying attention to human and systemic biases um, that are not necessarily captured or measurable within uh, your kind of traditional statistical approaches. So as I mentioned, there's, uh, we, we identified three categories of bias in AI um, working from left to right um, uh, is systemic bias. So systemic bias are biases that can be at the institutional level, at the historical level, and they result from procedures and practices of particular institutions that operate in ways which result in certain social groups being advantaged or favored and other groups being disadvantaged or devalued. So that's, so a, a, an institutional incentive on its own is may not necessarily be a bad thing, but when it um, leads to this kind of um, people being treated unfairly uh, due to those practices, then we're talking about systemic bias. Uh, systemic bias can be found um, in the data that build that is used to build models, in the practices and norms of organizations who build AI, obviously it's almost always inadvertent. Um, and then the computational and statistical category, again, this is the, the category of which um, traditional focus has been on. Um, these are, again, stem from errors that result when the sample is not representative of the population as kind of your most traditional form of statistical bias. Um, and can arise when algorithms can't extrapolate beyond the training data, it's due, potentially due to heterogeneous data, uh, representing complex data or concepts in simpler mathematical representations, over and underfitting the way outliers uh, are treated, um, data cleaning and imputation factors, all of this can lead to uh, computational statistical error um, and then lead to bias. Uh, and then of course, uh, I think, I'm sure, I'm sure most people are familiar with human cognitive bias. Uh, these are, you're talking kind of in your, um, the realm of thinking fast and slow, uh, basically systemic errors in the way 
uh, humans uh, make their decisions uh, off, these are usually implicit, tend to relate to um, how an individual or a group of individuals, so a, a team working on a, on a product, uh, can perceive information or make decisions to fill in missing or unknown information. So these kinds of biases are prevalent in institutional uh, decision-making, individual decision-making, group decision-making. And then of course, there's a whole set of other bias, uh, of biases when for people who are using the AI-based um, decisions. So how, whether uh, those uh, humans are over-trusting or under-trusting the AI, um, the, the result uh, from the AI. Um, so this is a, a, a taxonomy, this graphic um, helps convey those three categories of bias along with subcategories. So you can see up in the right hand corner is the category of systemic bias and we branch out to three subcategories of historical biases like um, uh, it, racism and sexism, societal biases, also like racism and sexism, uh, institutional biases. Um, in this case, uh, I think I, I'd like to use a, a start with an example from the tech world. So maybe your institutional bias is that um, uh, we want to get the product out to market as quickly as possible. Not a bad thing. Something that institutions are should have as a bias, but at times those biases can be in. Um, in tension with uh, societal values. And so uh, tools, you know, technology can get out there that, that has not taken into consideration um, the potential risks. In finance, you know, the financial industry, I, I guess the, probably the most, um, you know, obvious uh, institutional bias would be against, you know, uh, towards risk aversion, averting risk. And that uh, has led and can lead to under selection of individuals for loans. Um, so moving down to the statistical computational bias category, um, we have, we separate those into three. Um, those are biases that are uh, based on processing or validation. Oh, I just noticed there's a, a typo in there. <laughs> um, use and interpretation uh, biases and then selection and sampling, of course, kind of your biggest uh, set of uh, statistical um, bias. So in this case, I'd like to you know kind of point out uh, one example of content production bias. So, um, so let's say there's a FinTech model built on a given individual's language use in a certain context. So how this per person com communicates that led to the automated uh, system in presuming that the person is in a significantly different income bracket than they are. So the decision is biased in one way or the other. Another example is ecological fallacy. Um, and this is when you make a decision about an individual based on their membership in a group. Um, so automating a loan decision, for example, here, uh, based on the fact that an individual is a member of one group and not a member of another. Um, and obviously that can lead to bias uh, because it's not necessarily making the decision on, on the most um, uh, salient factor. Um, uh, moving up in, in the graphic, in the green category, you see human bias. Those are broken just like uh, statistical uh, biases into three subcategories. Those are, are uh, biases that are individual in nature. Um, oh, I'm sorry, it's just two, but we broke it out because there's so many individual biases. And then there's group bias. Um, I'm just gonna uh, pick on one, that one at the very top, automation complacency. complacency. Um, so this is when a lender or an end use practitioner can over rely on automated output and processes. Um, so this obviously is going to become particularly problematic when the output is biased in a systematic way. Um, so, um, you know, this looks like, uh, you know, uh, somebody at the end point of, of a decision saying, whatever the system said, I'm just going to go with that. I'm just going to go with that. But if the system has a kind of ingrained uh, statistical bent, uh, statistical bias, um, then that's going to just continuously perpetuate and then the humans not really doing their role of, of making sure that uh, the decisions are fair or, or appropriate. So um, we know, you know, we talked about there, there's all these risks with AI. 
what are some examples of harms? Um, I'm sure many of you are familiar, if you follow anything in the news, we're always hearing about um, you know, examples. Uh, facial recognition is a great uh, area, an example of a lot of uh, concern and har about harms, uh, misidentifications. Um, there's uh, an example in here about uh, the Twitter algorithm, and there was a hackathon that uh, Twitter put on to uh, identify um, how it was um, implicitly uh, creating implicit bias against older people in image selections uh, for, uh, on the platform. Um, great example uh, from the Stanford's uh, vaccine algorithm when the um, vaccine was first, the COVID vaccine was first made available. Um, they decided to uh, create an algorithm to identify who should get the vaccine first. And it turned out that all the uh, physicians were at the top of the list and everybody else was had to wait. Um, and so something about the algorithm learned this kind of hierarchical um, institutional bias inadvertently. Um, some more examples, um, again, well-known examples of um, how uh, skin type is not necessarily, is, is not a good proxy for race or ethnicity. Um, word embeddings uh, in, in job, app, job applicant resumes that um, are, are learning um, gender, uh, gender biases and, and, and creating and perpetuating and amplifying already existing um, biases. So, as I said uh, at the top, we, you know, the, the top three things I want to get across here is that we're advocating in, in the document for an approach that is beyond the technical pipeline, the, the, the pipeline, the, you know, the machine learning pipeline and saying that we can't just think about a statistical and computational problem that to really solve this, we have to have a, a more comprehensive approach. And that approach is referred to as socio-technical. What does that mean? Uh, so before I talk about what that means, I want to talk a little bit about techno solutionism. Um, and so techno solutionism tends to come from this uh, uh, a fallacy called the McNamara fallacy, which is an inherent bias um, for um, uh, the over trusting of numerical information over all other types of information. That numerical information is more valuable, more valid when it may actually not necessarily be the case. It's fine if it's valid when it's supposed to be. Um, so, uh, so that leads to uh, techno-solutionism, uh, the belief that technical solutions are uh, alone are sufficient for addressing complex problems that may in fact have uh, uh, you know, impacts beyond um, the computational world. So into the social, political, ecological, economic or ethical dimensions. Uh, assumes that maybe the, the way to fix this is just finding the right code or a certain algorithm that can be applied to any problem and, and potentially minimizes the relevance of human organizational and societal values and behavior um, and that all go into how uh, technology is designed, deployed, and used. And also, so I think this is what we're getting at is that it promotes a viewpoint that's just too narrow to effectively address specifically the risks of bias. Um, so what does it mean then to counteract techno-solutionism is uh, an approach that is context specific, centered on the human, focused on the impact, integrates societal values, and considers the anticipated real world value of an AI system rather than um, just to have a system. And really important here is that it draws upon domain expertise um, outside of outside of the expertise of the development of the, of the technology itself to bring in experts who are familiar. If you're building a, a FinTech system, you're gonna have to spend a lot of time with stakeholders with that expertise from that specific domain. So how does tech actually come to market? Um, the life cycle, the AI life cycle is, um, is that process. Um, there's a pre-design, uh, which feeds into design and development and then deployment. Um, the AI lifecycle helps organizations ensure delivery of high performing tech, but it doesn't necessarily identify risks or how to manage them. Um, so within SP1270, we identified three challenge areas for AI bias. The data sets that underlie the technology itself, 
um, the processes for test evaluation, validation and verification, and of course, all the human factors, uh, not just individual humans, but teams and organizations. Um, but it's important here that, especially as we talk about processes, that um, there is kind of a presumption that tests that AI systems undergo rigorous testing and validation, but that is actually under, under kind of what we would consider um, the, the same processes in scientific inquiry, but that's actually not um, uh, borne out in reality. Uh, there's usually missing rigorous experimental design or hypothesis generation and hypothesis testing. So our first challenge uh, from the socio, looking at it from a socio-technical perspective, we start with data. Um, of course, the, the most obvious concern in data is this sampling uh, issues related to sampling and representation. Those are differences between the data that's collected and what exists in the real world. Um, and in creation of feedback loops that design only for the most active users. You know, so we get a feed if, if you're if you're sampling and your representation is off, then you're building for only uh, uh, only one type of user. Um, missing data, again, is also likely to occur for non-represented groups, further uh, causing, you know, more entrenched biases. And then, and then again, we have this errors due to annotation, cleaning, and imputation. We have the creation of proxies and indices, which are often necessary, but can be a poor fit and take us away from context. So we're talking about things like, um, you know, criminality or, or lendability. Are they, a good, are they a good person to lend to? Those kinds of proxies are absolutely necessary, but you have to be very careful on how they're created um, because um, the next one is we're saying you know, you're flattening this very complex behavior into a mathematical construct. And within that um, process, you're kind of excising. Um, by excising the context, it's hard to get it back. Um, your, uh, other, other sources for uh, bias in data sets are inaccurate or inappropriate inferences, decisions based on data set availability instead of um, and, and access instead of whether it's a suitable data set for the question. The ability to infer protected attributes through proxy or latent variables. So, um, you know, protected attributes, I'm sure you're all completely familiar with them. We can infer gender through, um, through online behavior. We can infer zip code, through, I mean, race through zip code. Um, so uh, potential for bias to leak through there. Uh, collection of attributes that are not universally applicable for modeling, um, and yeah, just different ways of treating the data. So, to create guidance in how and and for managing bias, we have to consider um, this. Uh, really, the main question here is: Do data sets actually exist that are fit or suitable for the purpose of the various applications? domains and tasks for which the AI system is being developed and deployed. It seems really obvious and <laughs> when we think about it, but sometimes you know, decisions are made, again, within the institutional um, uh, uh, confines. So what, what can we do about, um, about data? And, and, and reducing bias within data. So obviously, you know, first of all, we get back to our statistical uh, methods. Our statistical approaches are incredibly valuable and important for um, data set fit and suitability. There are bias detection and mitigation approaches such as class or label imbalance measures. Uh, suggestion here to not train on benchmark data sets when, when you're going to use that data set for, for uh, on, real data when instead you're going to use the tool on real data in a specific application. Um, documentation and communication of the limits of the applicability. So we're talking, you know, transparency uh, approaches and then processes to account for the socio-technical context in which the application is being employed. Um, don't deploy and off-label uses, adopt processes that involve stakeholders, examine cultural dynamics and norms, and assess societal impacts. I think this is all probably ringing really familiar to, to the participants on this call. Um, and, then, and, and then just awareness of the interaction of human factors with the AI system. So you have the system itself, the organizational factors and decisions that go into making that system, and then the, um, the interaction of those two. So moving on to the next challenge area of test evaluation, validation and verification, um, 
you know, decision-making is, is very often uh, delegated to algorithms since machine learning systems can produce these, those decisions more consistently. But since AI systems don't work in a vacuum, negative impact that can occur, it, and it can occur at a speed and scale that brings a significant risk. So um, bias is also tightly connected to fairness. Um, it's social in nature, it's application and context specific and not a, just an abstract or a universal statistical problem. So, you know, with testing evaluation, we're seeking to answer the question, how do we know what's right um, in, in our system? How do we actually test it and make sure that the results are valid? Um, well, the problems here in, in, in these processes that are so, um, are, are trying to, you know, improve what we're doing, um, but modeling, sometimes we're modeling concepts that are only partially observable or capturable by data. Um, again, we come back to the proxy variable issues, lendability, what does that mean? Can we capture that with data? Um, we, we have our McNamara fallacy and, and techno solutionism here, a notion that algorithmic processes are more objective when in fact they may not be. Um, issues resulting from epistemic and aleatoric uncertainty, these are issues that are um, consistently at play in large language models. Um, or, and we rely on ever increasing large language models uh, to, to build these decisions. A singular focus on system performance or accuracy and optimization over whether it's fit for purpose, not taking context into consideration during model selection, testing in optimized conditions or conditions that are far from the deployed purpose, systems that use aggregated group data to predict individual behavior. It's a big source for bias. Um, and you know, practical factors uh, such as um, how opaque the model is, uh, uh, data dredging, confirmation bias. How do we fight against these, um, this set of biases? Well, um, algorithmic mitigation, there's debiasing methods in pre-processing, in processing or post-processing stages, and adjustments can be made to input var variables or model hyperparameters. Um, so those are kind of on the algorithmic side, but then there's just uh, the use of fairness metrics and other similar practices, there's many categories of fairness metrics. Um, make sure that you're developing and using proxies carefully, uh, slowing it down a little bit. Um, use of alternative learning tasks, such as unsupervised learning and reinforcement learning. Um, potential use of synthetically generated data. Uh, uh, that's a, something that we could talk about for a while. I'm just gonna leave that there. Um, using simulations, uh, making sure you're aligned with legal standards, minimize the number of input variables and ensure that there's no strong correlation amongst them and a logical relation to the prediction target. And I, the same thing we saw in data sets, uh, leverage subject matter expertise from context of use. So one of the things that um, uh, we hear a lot about is that uh, uh, Transparency is really important for, uh, for mitigating bias. Explainability is really important. But there's this great example of, um, of when algorithmic transparency was not uh, necessarily useful. Uh, um, so, you know, I, I, feel like, I feel like I'm behind in time. I only have seven minutes. So I'm actually, I'm actually just going to keep moving. Um, sorry about that. Um, so how... It, I, I want to get to this, uh, this slide and talk about how each of these categories of, of bias can contribute to AI harms. So we have systemic bias, statistical biases, and human biases. So those are prevalent in all three of what we've, what we've just discussed, right? So in the data sets and the processes and in uh, testing and evaluation. Um, and now uh, human factors and human biases uh, seeks, uh, in this case, the bias um, it becomes an issue in uh, because of who makes those decisions and how do they make them. And decisions are happening across the entire life cycle. Um, but there's also a lot of misconceptions and limitations about human factors. Um, uh, AI systems are used because they can make sense of information more quickly and consistently than humans. Um, but And AI systems are often perceived as more fair and less biased. But these perspectives have led to the deployment of AI systems because they're so trusted within, tr within very trusted settings and high stakes settings, such as hiring, criminal justice, financial industry. 
But the reality is that in such settings, AI systems can incorporate negative biases and perpetuate harms more quickly, extensively, and systematically than human and societal biases on their own, going back to that example uh, from hiring. Um, so what are the kinds of biases that can creep into AI uh, through the human, through who, whoever's making those decisions and how they're making them? Uh, so uh, systems can be built and uh, tested deta either detached from the context or in idealized scenarios. And then, of course, it's being deployed in a very different setting. Um, there's all these complex power and decision making structures across the AI lifecycle. Um, those are all come with their own implicit biases. It's optimistic expectations for human oversight as a catch all for faulty or flawed AI system decisions. So, oh, well, we know the AI system has a problem, but we've got a human at the other end. But what is, how, does that human know that they're being used as oversight? What, do they have detailed uh, requirements on when to step in or not? Uh, presenting information to an end user about how the AI system works instead of why, um, uh, how might be very useful for some users, but other users may really only want to know why a system uh, presented the output it did. What, what does that mean? What do they do with that information? Um, so again, non-explicit guidance and support for humans in the loop that gets to um, a human beings as oversight. Um, difficulty evaluating complex output uh, and then systems just detached from user intentions. So what can we do uh, to help address, again, I'm trying to go fast, uh, try to address all of these problems with human factors. I'm gonna get a talk at the very high level. Impact assessments are an approach that are, are gaining a lot of uh, momentum, uh, engaging in multi-stakeholders with multi-stakeholders, leverage their uh, subject matter expertise talk to the community that that, um, that a given, if it's appropriate for it, that any given AI system will be deployed in, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, both for the um, uh, people who are building the technology, because by empowering a diverse group of individuals, it can help broaden the views of the AI system designers and consider potential um, harmful impacts before they happen. Practice practical improvements, creating a culture of risk, something that the financial industry is very familiar with, um, and then system and procedural uh, transparency. So, but one of the biggest, um, uh, most effective tools for addressing AI bias is to keep the humans at the center of design. Human-centered design is one of those um, uh, we're often referred to as participatory approaches. Uh, Value-sensitive design is another co-design. Um, this is an approach to the design and the development of a system or technology that improves the ability of users to effectively and efficiently use the product, provides humans with designs that would be beneficial to their lives. Um, there's specific guidance about how to use, how, how to implement and deploy HCD um, methods within the design of, of technology. That is the ISO standard right there on the screen. Um, and then of course, governance, the other, well, possibly the biggest and most important and effective um, tool for, um, for improving, for changing the culture, transforming the culture around risk. Um, obviously governance is a holistic implementation tier, socio-technical in nature and informs each phase of the bias management process it doesn't simply focus on technical artifacts such as AI systems alone, but on organizational pro processes and cultural competencies. So, um, of course, and this uh, governance uh, practices tend to be more mature in those areas that are highly regulated, like um, the financial industry. Um, so, some of these practices are going to be very familiar to you all: monitoring. Uh, uh, policies and procedures, uh, risk mitigation, risk tiering, and information sharing. So what's next um, for us with this um, document? We will uh, be um, developing, uh, uh, so kind of boiling down existing guidance into uh, very um, easily consumable uh, uh, way. Uh, we will add guidance. We're going to be looking at test and evaluation processes, thinking about how we uh, deal with human in the loop and human oversight. 
uh, from, from a research pers perspective, and then uh, guidance in the other trustworthy characteristics, such as um, explainability and interpretability. So that is it for me. Thank you so much. I did not end with a quiz, though. I <laughs> 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 Thank you so much, Riva. This was an excellent presentation and um, we'll be sharing the slides so uh, you can continue the discussion online. And also uh, we have a 77 page paper, uh, which kind of, you know, details all the references and also some of the thought process which went into the putting together of this whole framework. So I've shared the link for the uh, actual document in the chat window. And uh, if you're interested, uh, please just go through the, the document. Now, um, as, as kind of you know, questions come in, um, one of the questions we have is, are there examples of rewards for uncovering AI or ML biases? Uh, that's a great question. So like a bug, <laughs> bug bounty type thing. Yeah, yeah. So there have been some bug bounty um, uh, examples. I think Twitter did a bug bounty. Um, for people to, to incentivize people finding uh, biases. It's certainly uh, an area of, um, of inquiry that I think is definitely gonna be useful. In the same way, you know, when we think there's a lot of um, comparisons between AI risks and cybersecurity risk, it's a little different. I think uh, how the risk emanates and how it, how it, um, how it plays out, but, uh, but some of those same processes like bug bounties, information sharing uh, can be brought to bear on, on AI. Mm -hmm. Perfect, perfect. Now, one of the questions I get asked a lot is how much is enough, right? Because it's uh, right. in the pragmatic world and especially in financial services wherein everything gets counted and everything is quantitative. Mm -hmm. um, there is a lot of emphasis on you know, optimization and process automation and leveraging AI and machine learning to speed up processes, getting the competitive edge. Um, and the question becomes, uh, we'll do regulation first because that's what needs to be done. And how much should we be doing in addition to doing it? So um, I was just kind of wondering how do we frame the problem? Because you know there is a lot of things which, um, like any other discipline, mm -hmm. um, you know there are a lot of you know directions in which we could be looking at the problem at, and the problem is real. I mean, like many times we don't even know why we have. I mean, you know, I, I grew up in India, and uh, when I came in here, and I was kind of you know following the rules of the road and uh, you know all the all the processes, but then uh, the 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 cultural conditioning which you have had right. basically makes you behave in certain ways, mm -hmm. right? right? So, and I think that's kind of uh, within the system. I mean, like, you know, mm -hmm. no system is perfect. And uh, we are now trying to like, you know, learn from our past behaviors when we are designing machines and the machines learn from these past behaviors. And that's why we are seeing all these biases creep into these machine driven algorithms, right? Now, where should it start and how much is enough? And that's a loaded question, obviously. But what, what are your thoughts? And how should an organization approach bias assessments and you know, uh, factoring bias as a part of the, the whole design process? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. And I think, so I would I always start by saying we, and we say this in the document, both, both the SP and, and in, in the risk management framework that there's never going to be zero bias. We cannot scientifically meet that. That's just not going to happen. Um, that doesn't mean, okay, well, <laughs> we can't do zero bias. Let's just not do anything. Uh, but I, I do think that there's a lot of room uh, to be a uh, lot of improvement to be made. I think there's also a lot of space for a lot for innovation. So to be clear, and uh, just for everyone who's who's uh, on the call, that NIST is not a regulatory agency, so we don't do regulation. Um, so that that whole question of whether um, uh, of whether an industry should be regulated and how it should be regulated is is, is, is for someone else to answer. But what we can do is um, a, through the framework and through the, these kinds of guidance documents like SP 1270 is we can provide uh, scientific and technical criteria, requirements, um, guidance for how to actually improve it. And we're going to do that from the computational perspective of, well, what, what should the algorithm be what improvements can we make to, algor to algorithmic processes 
um, so that they're performing better, more accurately, and 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 also not just by accuracy, but less biased um, mm -hmm. and, and more explainable and more interpretable and more trustworthy. But then there's all these process things. And I think that that's where there's uh, there's not a lot of guidance on, um, mm -hmm. on, on that. And so can, what can we create? Um, one of the, I think one of the reasons that SP 1270 had such a relatively positive splash is that, oh yeah, there's this whole other area of things that we can do to help transform the culture. Cause you can't really transform the culture with algorithms. Mm -hmm. um, you can transform a segment of that culture that's focusing on the, the, fairness and bias issues in the algorithm. But there's all these other practices that we that we need to think about to uh, change the culture, information sharing, and, you know, governance and all of the all of the cultural competencies that come with that, um, that people can um, uh, start changing and asking the right questions. And um, maybe we don't rely so much on transparency alone or, or throwing a human in the mix just Willy nilly, and just like oh, just put a human on, just put a mm -hmm. human on it, um, and and just uh, as a, a shameless plug, I will say we we had a um, we had a workshop at the end of March, three days, two days on the risk management framework, one day on AI bias. Please uh, t take a look at some of those um, presentations as if you're specifically interested in bias. On the last day, we uh, we go through data sets, uh, te uh, testing evaluation, and human in the loop. And, and kind of touched upon what are the what are some of the things that we can be thinking about from a socio-technical perspective that we can implement, um, even even begin to start some of this stuff um, that we may not necessarily know what the best practices are, um, mm -hmm. but we can get started thinking about them. Uh, so mm -hmm. yeah, I just I do think there's a a, a big uh, uh, there's a, a lot of room for growth. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, you know, speaking of the the the, the the testing evaluation methodologies, uh, verification and validation. Um, there, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of, you know, I mean, like I came from the technical world mm -hmm. uh, in kind of validating, you know, scientific uh, algorithms and for meant for certain purposes, both hardware and software. So I'm a big fan of the whole VNV kind of process. Mm -hmm. um, do you foresee, you know, things wherein there is going to be some kind of a formal assessment which would be either, you know, uh, from someone who is self-policing and saying, okay, this is what we have done. We have done a bias assessment and this is like a disclosure of what we have done, uh, which would leave room for potential improvements and comments kind of a thing or versus, you know, organizations mandating that you got to get this amount of testing at least done either internally or through an external party. So do you see some kind of a gating process of sorts for bias assessments or is this something which, um, you know, contextually every organization has to figure out like what they need to do uh, when they're building and deploying algorithms? Yeah, I mean, hopefully, so yeah, we hope and, and through the risk management framework and the use of profiles within the risk management framework, mm -hmm. we're hoping that not everybody has to figure this out on their own. And so we're trying to build this framework broadly enough that, um, that the guidance in one context can be useful in another. Um, you know, so what can we learn? What can, what have we learned in the financial industry that can be employed and uh, deployed to mm -hmm. you know, healthcare or, or yeah. criminal justice? Uh, are there this kind of common set of themes? Um, but whether, so whether organizations want to mandate that, I, I actually think that if we, can um, incentivize that so gets a little bit back to bug bounty. So if you can incentivize, like look at all the benefit that you can have by just like better governance processes mm -hmm. or thinking about um, how, um, how your, where is the system going to be deployed? How do you engage with the stakeholders? Is there a set of criteria? Is there a set of like, here's, here's a protocol for how to engage with stakeholders and what do you, what are the questions that you really want to ask them? How do you identify data sets um, instead of it being about just what's available, how can we, how can you get a better, a better match for that? Th those are really hard questions, but um, I think, I, I don't think uh, we're going to be successful if we're all kind of siloing that out. I think we're, we're hoping to serve as kind of a hub for the community to help ask those questions and potentially answer them together. And then, um, of course, we'll, we'll produce that guidance and get it out there for everyone.
I'm not saying we're the only people who are going to, you know, we're, we're going to collaborate with everyone we can to try and, and get those answers out there. But then there's all sorts of other groups doing amazing work as well. Yeah, that, that kind of leads into my, you know, most likely the last question. Um, when you talk about like, you know, collaboration with other agencies, I know there is a whole European Union initiative for AI and that's kind of, you know, all these drafts are floating around. And uh, organizations, when I talk to them, they kind of are somehow in you know, a wait and watch more because there is the US side of the regulations, but they're expected to do certain kinds of things in Europe. Um, so uh, I was just wondering if, you know, NIST are, you know, what is your thought process in terms of, you know, how do you make sure that, you know, when the systems get deployed, I mean, like, you know, an Apple Watch is an Apple Watch which gets mm-hmm. used throughout the world, right? right. And, uh, and how do you think about, like, you know, bringing the world together in addressing certain challenges, um, yeah. especially when, you know, there are lacks enforcement and, um, you know, uh, cost becomes a major concern at certain aspects. And then, uh, I mean, like I was um, doing a research project for uh, skin uh, evaluation. Um, uh, basically, it was, I mean, the, the, the use case was pretty simple. It was uh, type of acne evaluation. And I had a lot of skin related data, which um, I was kind of looking at. And I was talking to a couple of entrepreneurs and people who are working in the field. And they were talking about like, well, look, data collection is a big problem because it right. costs uh, 10 to $20 per image if we go through all the formal regulations and we collect all the data in a formal way. Um, so there are all these data brokers who basically solicit you know, people in other countries and they pay pennies on the dollar to yeah. get data and then they package it and then they sell it to you know, companies. Right. And uh, there is a whole business out there trying wow. to like, you know, uh, and there is uh, obviously, you know, I mean, uh, not in a good way, but in, in some ways you are trying to optimize the process to collect right. the data because you need the algorithms right. to work properly and you cannot invest 10 to $20 um, in, a, in a court setting here. Right. So, um, there are all these pragmatic challenges, you know, the, right. even though companies may want to do the right thing, there are all these like cost related decisions and exactly. somebody else's algorithm may be better just because they source hundreds of thousands of images from multiple parts of the world, you know, and, you know, you were sourcing it ethically, ethically yep. sourced data in, um, in here. So I don't know what your thoughts are because it's a systemic problem, you know, when there is no easy answer to it. Yeah, that's such a great question. And and, and by the way, that's is just very similar kind of uh, well, thing of happened that, you know, with Mechanical Turk, right? That, you know, oh, it used to cost so much money to get users. Oh, but we can pay them less because they're, they're just doing it. And then a whole, a whole new enterprise uh, props up. So, and, and obviously there's a lot of ethical considerations mm-hmm. with that. And so those issues around who's resourced and who is not resourced to, Uh, carry out high quality, uh, best of intentions, don't have the ability to carry out high quality research are real. Um, Mm -hmm. There is a um, uh, organization or an entity within the federal government called the National AI Research Resource Research Task Force. It's a Mm -hmm. long mouthful. Uh, NARE, um, uh, NIST has a a seat on that. One of our uh, our chief of uh, ITL's chief of staff sits on that um, task force and they are dealing with exactly those questions and hearing from, um, you know, the best in academia and and civil society and and, and, in the in private industry about how to how to tackle those problems. But yeah, it's, it's real. And Yeah, and that's, I think that there's a lot of ethical questions. I, I think I hate to like be, I really hate to be the person to say I'm not an ethicist, but I'm going to say I'm not an ethicist, you know, just because it seems like I'm passing the passing the buck. But um, yeah, exactly. And those are, those are the kinds of systemic um, incentive, you know, s- systemic mindset things that don't get thought about, you know, especially when we're thinking at a computational level or even the human bias level. It's like, what about all these incentives 
that we're not even able to put a, a name on them or, or, or to label them like that's going on. And that's actually a huge problem. So how do we address that? Um, so we don't necessarily address it. Um, and can, can it be addressed uh, computationally? That's, that's a really good question. Yeah, and, and I mean, uh, to wrap up today's session, mm -hmm. I think this is the kind of discussion we are trying to encourage in the Quant University setting, you know, in educational programs, in yeah. trying to bring these, you know, both the uh, pragmatic issues to light, but also some of the formal research. I mean, you've done 77 pages worth of research, which has been published. So probably there were at least 10 times the amount of research you have looked at or put together and summarized. 285, this 285 re references, <laughs> something like that. <laughs> right. So yeah, um, yeah, thank you. Thank yeah. you for this. This yeah. is amazing. I mean, like, thank you for you know putting this together and also many of the other initiatives, which NIST has. I'm a big fan of uh, your work and also the organization supports, you know, uh, inclusiveness by bringing everybody to these, you know, meetings mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, uh, make their voice heard. Um, my my uh, last concluding remarks is I think, you know, AI itself is an evolving field. And, exactly. uh, you know, there is a lot of discussion and we need a lot of stakeholders to the table. And uh, um, one of the um, one of the advantages of being, you know, here in the, I mean, I'm a, I'm a part academic, so, you know, being in the academia, being in the pragmatic world, um, we see a lot of uh, thoughtful discussions, um, but many a times uh, there is a whole community of end users who won't even have a voice in these decisions, and they're just going to be using systems. And I think um, um, as a part of the assessment, we try to make sure that the end user's voice needs to be heard and needs to be factored in. You know, I mean, even going back to the Apple Watch, right? So it was designed as a premium tool, but it's gonna be used throughout the world. And you know, a lot of companies will you know, have access to certain APIs and they'll have to build systems for those APIs. So yep. I think um, you know, one of the thought processes, every organization which is looking at AI should be having some amount of thought put into what biases actually mean from the data they're using, the data they're consuming, the system mm -hmm. they're consuming, and if they have the ability to have a say, make sure that they put in their you know, thought and make that statement heard. Right. Uh, and uh, uh, I think the more we talk about this, we are gonna elevate the amount of discussion and uh, hopefully become a part of the mainstream discussion rather than you know a exactly. specific discussion only in happening exactly. in academia and research circles. Yeah. Uh, music to my ears, that's exactly what we wanted to do was to elevate these concepts and questions so that it's not a side conversation. Yeah. Absolutely. Exactly. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you so much, Riva. Thank you for saying, uh, taking uh, you know the time of your busy day and uh, presenting your work. It's uh, again I put the link in the chat window. And if anybody is interested, please reach out to Riva uh, for any other discussions. And also, as I mentioned, um, they're, uh, they're accepting comments for the AI risk management framework. And uh, if you have any questions about any of our programming or Quant University offerings, please reach out to us and we'll be happy to get back to you. Again, next week, we'll have another session on modern risk management for machine learning models. That's going to be on Tuesday. Please tune in. And if you have any comments or suggestions for speakers or topics, we are always welcome, uh, we'll always welcome your suggestions. Please reach out to us and we will try to see if we can invite your favorite guest speaker or try and put together a session on the topic of interest. Thank you again and have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye.